Um, where were we? So you're, you, you, you're born, whatever is inside your ovary are called primary oocyte. Then you reach puberty, the primary oocyte will undergo first meiosis, meiosis one. One of the cell is small, one of the other cell is really big. We call it secondary oocyte. Then it will be ovulated. And once it's ovulated, if a sperm meets that secondary oocyte, this secondary oocyte will complete its meiosis too, only after fertilization of a sperm. Okay? Another diagram here. So when you're born, you have many of these uh, follicles, primary oocyte. So imagine inside your ovaries, you see those small dots. Those are all follicles, little cells. But when you reach puberty, this primary oocyte will start to become larger. Every month, a group of them become large. Some of the, some of the follicles or primary oocyte become really, really large than the rest. And that will be your secondary oocyte that will be ovulated. The rest that didn't become large, they just stay here as follicles inside the ovaries. Another, di another diagram here. So you have oogonium inside the ovary. They keep dividing um, during mitosis. So you have plenty of oogonium. Uh, you're born with a primary oocyte. When you reach puberty, this becomes really big. And then it will undergo meiosis one. First polar body dissolves, secondary oocyte is ovulated. If there is a sperm, the sperm will complete meiosis two of the ovum. And then you have another smaller second polar body. This is how it looks like under the microscope. So you have a maturing follicle. When it's really big, we call it graphian follicle. Graphian follicle. Um, and then you have all the other follicles around it. So inside your maturing follicle, you will have your secondary oocyte. All right, spermatogenesis. Production of sperm. The cells from which sperm cells arise. The spermatogonia divide by mitosis. One daughter cell remains a spermatogonium, and the other becomes a primary spermatocyte. The primary spermatocyte divides by meiosis to form secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes divide again to form spermatids. The spermatids differentiate into sperm cells. So, it sounds like oogenesis. For oogenesis, you have oogonia. For spermatogenesis, it's spermatogonia. For oogenesis, you have primary oocyte. For spermatogenesis, you have primary. Uh, for, for oogenesis, you have primary oocyte. We have here primary spermatocyte. You have secondary oocyte. We have prim secondary spermatocyte and then we have additional cells we call spermatids and then your sperm cell or spermatozoa so again from that spermatogonium they keep dividing one become one becomes large we call it sp primary spermatocyte it will further develop during meiosis into secondary spermatocyte which will undergo secondary meiosis to have four haploid cells we call them spermatids there's no tails yet and then they will form their tails and you have your sperms ready to be um, instead of ovulated we call it ejaculated out of the testis all right so first of all um let's look at some diagram here so we have the male reproductive system have the penis and the testis so if we look at the testis if we cut it like this way and look at it from the top. Um, zoom that in. Um, if you look at the testis, it looks like it has like tubes. 
like small intestine tubes. We call them seminiferous tubules. And if we cut this from the top, we see them as individual circles. So this is the, sorry, zoom down. So this is your tubule, another tubule, another tubule there, another tubule, or right here, that's the actual tubule, like from here. So from the top, it looks like a circle, but it's a cross section of a tubule. And why do you have to learn that? If you look at the staining of the picture, it looks like you have dots here, right? Like clear dots. Those are your spermatogonia. They, they mature from outside to inside of the tubule. So the outside walls, that's your spermatogonia. Then right here, you will have your primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermatids. And remember, your sperm has tails. So right before they're ejaculated, they're concentrated inside here in the tube. So that's where they're formed and they've matured here. And then once inside the tube, remember that's a tube, it will all come out of the tubule and they will stay here in a structure called epididymis. So you make the sperms here, then you store them here. Okay, how is it made? From outside to inside of the tubule. Spermatogonia, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermatids, and then sperms. Clear? Um, a diagram of spermato spermatogenesis. So you have your spermatogonia. They will keep dividing. The larger one we call primary spermatocyte. It will divide. Um, after meiosis one, you have two secondary spermatocytes. After meiosis two, you have four spermatids. And then as they develop their tails, we call them sperm cells. Now let's compare the two. Location. Spermatogenesis in the testis. Oogenesis, where does it happen? Ovaries. Meiotic division, equal division of cells, but for oogenesis, it's an equal. What's our evidence here? Formation of your polar bodies, which is much smaller. Um, gametes, you form four. Oogenesis, how many do you form? Gametes. One from one. From one ogonia, you only have one because the polar bodies die. They dissolve inside the ovaries. Sperms, though, are much smaller. For your ova, they're larger because, remember, the polar bodies are very small. So the other oocyte is much larger in size. Timing. Um, uninterrupted. Beginning at puberty, they start producing sperms until they die. For females, arrested stages. It begins when we were a fetus, and then monthly, beginning at puberty, but when we hit menopause, that's about late 40s, we stop ovulating, we stop producing secondary oocyte. For males, forever. So if you're a female and you're, you're of an older age, you can't really give birth anymore. But males, even when they're old, like 60s, 70s, they can still have children because they can produce sperms. All right, so this is the final product, your secondary oocyte and your sperm. So you need to know the parts of your egg. It's also in the book. Okay, so from outside to inside, you have layer of follicle cells. Remember, the ovary is made up of follicles. So around your secondary spermat, sec secondary oocyte, you have those follicle cells. And then you have the layers now. We have your what's the outside? zona pellucida first. So made up of glycoproteins. Under that, your plasma membrane. And then, of course, your nucleus. What's important here for you to know is the zona pellucida. So we're going to talk about that shortly. And then your plasma membrane. So much, much larger in size. Diameter about 110 microns. If you look at the parts of your sperm, 
you're looking at the head, an important part of the head is the acrosome. It's like the helmet of the sperm. We will talk about the acrosome shortly. And then you have the nucleus. All of the nucleus is in the head. And then on the neck part, sorry, there's three parts, head, neck, and tail. On the neck part, you have plenty of what organ now? Mitochondria. Why do you think there's a lot of mitochondria there? Just to form ATP so this can move for swimming of the tail. And then your tail here is made up of microtubules, protein microtubules, that can produce movement. Like a, It's very similar to the structure of your flagella. Okay. Questions with spermatogenesis and oogenesis. Very good. Okay. Um, let's talk about polyspermy. So for humans, it is very unlikely to, to have more than one child. Every time the mom is pregnant, one baby. Um, identical twins, it happens but not as common. Triplets, it happens, but not as common. Quadruplets, though, it happens, and, and then you're interviewed in the news because it's very rare. So what's common for us is one fetus, one child, one zygote, one embryo. Now, how, how does this happen? We have an event called polyspermy. Poly means many sperm. So for humans, we have a process to prevent polyspermy. So we just, we just have one zygote after union of the sperm and the egg so three steps you need to discuss for the test polyspermy uh, preventing polyspermy three processes first acrosome reaction two penetration of the egg membrane and three cortical reaction um so let's look at the picture here remember your egg cell i said there's two important layers zona pellucida and the plasma membrane so at first number one um so egg, uh, sperms will swim towards your egg the first sperm to swim close to the egg um, will come in contact with uh, zona pellucida the number two acrosome reaction remember there's an i said the helmet of the sperm it has acrosome so those are enzymes um that will what what's happening here it looks like it's secreting the enzyme and permeating deforming or dissolving this layer of the egg Okay, and then number three, growth of acrosomal process. So it seems like it's trying to attach to the, what is this layer right here? Sorry, vitellin layer. Okay, and then step four, fusion of the plasma membrane of the egg and the sperm. So as you can see, membrane of your sperm has join the membrane of the egg that's the membrane plasma membrane right plasma membrane of the egg plasma membrane of your sperm number five entry of the sperm nucleus or the nucleus is released into the egg cytoplasm number six cortical reactions what is this cortical reaction it what it activates The sperm activates the egg. But look at the diagram. You see these vesicles? They're present, right? And then just when the membrane fused, what happened to the cortical? What happened to the cortical granule? Are they closing it? But what happened? It was inside the vesicle and then released, right? The cortical granules are released here. Now, what will that do if the cortical granules are released outside the membrane of your egg? It will harden the zona pellucida. So, 
Oh, during, during, very good question. During ovulation, only this is ovulated. The follicular cells remains in the ovary as your corpus luteum. Good question. All right. So, where is it? Upon fertilization, your cortical granules will be released and it will harden, it says, harden jellicoat, harden the zona pellucida. All right. So, again, acrosome, acrosome reaction. So, your acrosome will dissolve your zona pellucida and then sperm cell will fuse. The membrane of the sperm cell will fuse with the membrane of the egg cell. That's penetration. And upon fusion of the membranes, the cortical granules will be released outside of the membrane to harden the zona pellucida. Clear? One, two, three. Acrosome reaction, penetration, and then cortical reaction. Don't They sound the same on the test. I have students switch this. Acrosome reaction and cortical reaction. Acrosome is enzymes of the sperm melting the zona pellucida. Cortical reaction is release of the cortical granules to harden the zona pellucida. Okay. All right. So let, you have your sperm, you have your egg. Either it's fertilized outside or inside of the body. So for aquatic animals, maybe you already know this, um, eggs are released. I, I like this clip on Finding Nemo. Wow. Yes, Marlon. I, no, I see it. It's beautiful. So, Coral, when you said you wanted an ocean view, you didn't think you were going to get the whole ocean, did you? Huh? They were talking. And did your mandala were... better believe they did? Oh, I do, I do. I really do. Ocean view and all that, but do we really? Look, look, look. They wake up, poke their little heads out, and they see a so they go down and look at their eggs. Oh, there. Look. They're dreamy. Start off fertilization. We still and have the same. This half is. Marlon Jr. And then this half Coral Jr. Okay, we're done. I like Nemo. There's too many eggs, right? They even say this half Mar uh, half Coral Jr. half Marlon Jr. Why do you think there's when they for for their fertilization they release plenty of eggs? For us, polysperm may just one. Well, why, why for like these um, marine animals, they need to have plenty of fertilized egg. Chances of survival are very small. So at the end here, you'll see that there you have a predator and it ate all of the eggs. Only one is left. What's that one left? Anyway, only one is left. And other than that, if you love sushi, those are all fertilized eggs. Um, I don't even know why. I mean, I like it, but I'm like, why do Japanese, like imagine all of those potential fish and all you do is swallow it. You don't even chew it and enjoy it. Um, but anyway, Sally's correct because of survival rate. Very low, so they need to produce a lot of fertilized egg. Um, okay, aquatic animals release their gametes directly into the water. Um, but this is at higher risk of predation and also environmental variation. What does it mean? Temperature may change or pH of the water may change. So all of those can be can put your eggs at risk. Now, terrestrial animals, that's us, um, use internal fertilization so that zygote, that embryo, will grow inside the uterus. Um, but then, it's just mentioned here in the book, in evolution, marine mammals, so we were once in water, right? External fertilization, then we became terrestrial animals, so we use internal fertilization. But some of those animals went back to water. Manatee, seal, sea lion, dolphin. Those are marine mammals, so they still use internal fertilization. Okay. All right. So, 
we were reviewing oh, Genesis right here. So we have an ovulated secondary oocyte. Then it will go into the fallopian tube. As it rolls around this tube, it may or may not meet a sperm. But right there, you see that sperm penetrated the egg. So fusion of um, male and female gametes here. And then this has one nucleus. How many nucleus does this have? Two nucleuses. So this one ball of cell will start to undergo mitosis. As it rolls over the fallopian tube, you have two cells here. Then you have 16 cells, we call it morula. Then you have 58 cells, we call it now a blastocyst. We start calling it a blastocyst if there's a deformed layers. So this is still a ball of cells. This one seems to have like empty spaces already and some layers, we call it a blastocyst. And then even more pronounced here, you see the cavity there inside. So when you get into med school, you will learn the names of these layers, the actual names of the cells um, in your class called embryology. Uh, but for now, let's simplify. So you have a blastocyst. And what seems to be happening here? The blastocyst is attaching, extending its membrane into this thickened uterus. So it will start growing here as it attaches to the uterus. So this whole process is called implantation, to plant itself into the walls of the uterus, okay? Again, first union, we call it zygote. As it starts to divide, well, we still call it zygote. When it starts to form empty space and layers, we call it blastocyst. And then the blastocyst will implant itself here. After eight weeks, we call this a fetus. Zygote, blastocyst, and then after eight weeks, we call it a fetus. <clears throat> so your blastocyst is a hollow ball-shaped embryo. Um, there's a cavity here, an empty space. It's hollow inside, but it's made up of layers of cells outside. Another diagram here for you to visualize. So this is your blastocyst. Remember, again, I said it's hollow inside. And then you have layers outside. When we talk about brain development, we will talk about the blastocyst again. Uh, we will talk about the layers of the cells here that will develop into your brain and your spinal cord. All right. <clears throat> so what you can see here is the membrane of the blastocyst extending into the walls of the uterus, implanting itself, not just attached, because when you say attach, it's like attach. Implant is part of the blastocyst grows inward. It, it, it implants, goes inside of the uterus, and then it for, uh, continues to develop. All right. Now, HCG. HCG is produced by your embryo. So this embryo right here, after it attaches itself here in the walls, that growing embryo will produce HCG. HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin. So what does this hormone do? This hormone, once released, it stimulates the ovary to continue to produce progesterone and estrogen. Um, it's the corpus luteum that produces it. I need a picture. Ovary. Corpus luteum. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, backtrack a little bit. When, with the diagram, when the secondary oocyte is released, Sadly, remember the follicular cells, I said, stays inside the ovary as this body of cells called the corpus luteum. Corpus means corpse, dead body. Luteum, yellowish. So there's a yellowish dead ball of cells inside the ovary, call it corpus luteum. This corpus luteum continues to secrete progesterone and estrogen. And what does progesterone and estrogen do? It keeps your uterus thick. Uh, 
Okay. So HCG produced by the embryo, it stimulates the corpus luteum to continue producing progesterone and estrogen, which maintains the thickness of your, um, sorry, which maintains the thickness of your uterus. All right. Okay, so about eighth week, two months, the placenta will be formed. And we call this not an embryo anymore, but we call it a fetus. So why do we need a placenta? Because the, the ball of cell continues to grow and you have less. Before placenta, there's just diffusion from mother to the embryo diffusion of nutrients and waste products but when the the embryo becomes bigger you have a, a big surface area but a much much bigger volume so the surface area to volume ratio is very small it means if you just depend on diffusion it wouldn't be able to supply all of the needs of the fetus so this fetus will now grow a connection to your mom we call that a placenta um, it the structure looks like this so you have a, a, a bigger fetus now surface area to volume ratio decreases there's more volume that needs to be uh, that needs supply of nutrients so the placenta please look is part of the fetus it's not part of the uterus This is the uterus wall, the light pink. So it's like a wall of the fetus interlocking with the wall of the uterus. Okay? But they're not connected because there is a space. It says they're intervillous space. There's a very small space between the placenta and the uterine wall. I'm sorry, this this color right here? No, never mind. All right, all right, all right, all right. So, going back. Um, underdeveloped offsprings, just mentioned by your book, like your kangaroo. You know, like, they're born, then they come out of the pouch, they can walk around, then come back again, because they're not yet fully developed. But they have a complex placenta structure where in the, what do you call the kangaroo baby? Kid? Chloe? A Joey. <laughs> Joey, Joey. So this can come out and then come back to further develop, come out, come back to further develop. So they can keep attaching, detaching to the placenta. For us, just one connection when we're born, we, this is cut already. Um, monotremes mentioned in the book. Uh, those are organisms that that release hardened shells or eggs, so they don't need placenta. Okay. So some other structures here. Your placenta, you can see it at, as this layer right here. So again, if I zoom this in, it looks like this. Okay. Um, it makes sure it makes sure that you have close contact with the uterus, so you can have easier exchange of nutrients and waste products. And then you also have what you call an amniotic sac, another layer of membrane that protects you, because inside you have amniotic fluid. So even if you're pregnant and you keep moving, this water will absorb the shock. So it's a shock absorber. Fetus can continue to grow. You can see the placenta right there. Um, and then another picture here. Whatever. Here. Okay. So if you look at maternal blood, let's look at this diagram here first. Obviously, for the mom's blood, there's plenty of oxygen. There's plenty of glucose from the food. There's plenty of antibodies released by white blood cells. There's water. But here in the fetal blood, it's growing, right? So it has waste products such as carbon dioxide, 
obviously the baby is already metabolizing there's excretion of urea and it also has water so how does the exchange occur obviously the fetus needs oxygen and glucose so this goes into the fetal blood through diffusion and facilitated diffusion the waste products carbon dioxide and urea diffuses into the maternal blood so exchange of nutrients with the uh, waste products of the fetus let's look at the diagram here <clears throat> so you have your umbilical cord and this umbilical cord uh, let's zoom in okay so this umbilical cord has capillaries right there that are in close proximity to the blood vessels of the mom so here is your capillaries from the umbilical cord very close connection to the blood vessels of the mom I think on the test they asked the distance okay please uh, note this the distance between fetal and maternal blood is as little as five micrometers the cells that separate maternal and fetal blood form the placental barrier so this is about five micrometers that's very close there's easy diffusion of nutrients into the placenta and waste products out of the placenta into the maternal blood circulation okay talking about that placenta so your connection to your mom part of your placenta is the umbilical cord um, at ninth week this corpus luteum will start to degenerate remember what the corpus luteum produces and estrogen to keep the uterus thick suddenly at the at ninth week it will degenerate but as it degenerates the placenta will start secreting progesterone and estrogen so it's fine but it says there there's a danger of miscarriage if the switch fails so the placenta will take over release of progesterone and estrogen but what if it didn't produce as much and then your corpus luteum already is dissolved suddenly there's going to be weakening of the uterus some pregnant women experience miscarriage at the ninth week so after two months um, that's when pregnancy is most sensitive maybe maybe you knew that at the death was pregnant did you know maybe you're not close with her um cafeteria one of our cafeteria at is there just pregnant last october and then she had a miscarriage so the reason was she rode the tricycle and it was really bumpy so they th they think it's the bumpiness but it's actually the switching of these hormones it can also be the switching of these hormones maybe there's what the, it, the, the hormones were switching and then she had a bumpy ride and then the baby detached from the uterine wall she had a miscarriage um, so first two months more sensitive first two to three months because you want to make sure that that baby attaches some pregnant women they can easily get pregnant but they but they always have miscarriages my auntie also had this her second baby she went to the bathroom she peed then when she looked at the toilet bowl it was all blood she didn't even feel that the uterus the uterine wall um, went out so the layers went out with together with it your embryo we call it the we call it the fetus starting eighth so eight to nine huh the ultrasound oh, it's still a small ball of embryo no no it's not it's not yet the full grown maybe I have a picture so it's still kind of like this so it's not a full grown um, fetus yet so just all blood and tissues of the uterus okay 
So structure of placenta and hormones of your placenta. Next, parturition, giving birth. All right. So we have here from pregnancy is about nine months, and it's always nine months because it's closely controlled by your hormones. So let's look at your hormones here. The first few months of your pregnancy, you have increase of HCG brought to you by what produces HCG? Huh? Corpus luteum. No, corpus luteum produces HCG, remember? The embryo produces, yes, correct, HCG. And then the corpus luteum produces progesterone and estrogen. So you have high levels of estrogen and progesterone. Now towards the end, look at what happens, what happened in your progesterone and estrogen here. A, a really sudden abrupt decrease. So at that ninth month, 38 weeks, 37 to 38 weeks, there's a sudden decrease in progesterone. This is a negative feedback. That sudden decrease in progesterone tells the brain to release another hormone called oxytocin. Okay, What does oxytocin do? It contracts the walls of the uterus. So suddenly no progesterone, brain produces oxytocin. Oxytocin contracts the walls of your uterus. Now what does it do? It stimulates contraction of your myometrium. By the way, myometrium is the muscle layer of your uterus. Muscle layer of your uterus starts to contract. Now, there are stretch receptors in the muscles that senses the contraction and tells the brain, tells the pituitary gland to keep secreting oxytocin. So that's a positive feedback. So there's oxytocin, it contracts the muscles. The nerves detect the muscle contraction, tells the brain to further increase production of oxytocin. So you keep increasing production of oxytocin, that's called the positive feedback system. Overall, the, the, uter the uterus really contracts. That's when your mom or the pregnant woman starts to go into labor. Those contractions are very painful. So it takes them half a day, several hours, of just enduring that painful contraction. Um, but what happens during the contraction? You, as doctors, you monitor the diameter here of the cervix. Miss, what's the cervix? So this is your uterus. There's a, like an opening, a flap here in the bottom. We call this the cervix. So vagina, cervix, and then uterus. So it's the gate of your uterus. So what's happening here in the diameter of the cervix? It's becoming bigger and bigger. So the woman is in labor, doctor keeps checking. They do a, a check, how many centimeters, how many centimeters. If they know it's big enough, then the doctor can proceed to the operating room to deliver the baby. Um, I had a demonstration before. What we did was, I have a balloon, I have a ping pong ball. I put the ping pong ball in the opening. Then you keep pressing here. Then you see the ball slowly coming out of the balloon until the cervix is really wide and the, the balloon pops out. Anyway. No. No, no, no. The baby comes out. This this really dilates. If if it's really big, but the head if if it diameter is wide. But the head is so big, then they can cut. But normally they don't because the cervix will, will accumulate for the expansion. Accommodate, not accumulate. Accommodate for the expansion of the cervix. Okay. Um, so between contraction, as you can see here, they monitor the diameter of the cervix. It's still small. And then keep contracting. By the way, this is a molecule of oxytocin. It further um, move, it moves the baby further down the uterus and stretches the cervix. 
whereas this is fully dilated, 10 centimeters when they measure, okay, ready to give birth. Operating room now. Yes. They also do experience contraction, but this doesn't dilate. So there's not enough room to accommodate for the head, shoulder, body of the baby. So they just cut it from here. Or um, for cesarean section, if the woman goes into labor for a long time, normally it's just half a day, several hours, but for a long time overnight, then the doctor will say, it's just contracting, but cervix is not ready to dilate. So they do it through the abdomen. They cut the abdomen, they uh, through the fat, under the fat layer, then they cut the uterus, and then they take out the baby. All right, uh, another picture here. So um, position at birth, it's the head first. What's the problem if it's the feet first? Tendency that the head can get stuck there in the cervix. So just before giving birth, uh, ultrasound also, they monitor if the head rotated and the head is right there in the bottom. So baby passes into the vagina. Baby is pushed out of the mother's body. You know, like the mom goes like, oh. So that just helps oxytocin. But majority of the muscular contraction is coming from oxytocin. This helps. If this doesn't help, the doctor can do a fundal push. They push it here. They help the mom push the baby out and then the baby is out remember the placenta was attachment to the mom through the umbilical cord so this comes out and then the doctor cuts the umbilical cord for my puppies when the placenta come out they eat the placenta it looks grayish so there's the umbilical cord they they cut the uh, they eat the amniotic sac they lick the puppy they cut the umbilical cord. Oh, dogs are so smart. They really cut it, and then they eat the umbilical cord. If the placenta comes out, then he also eats the placenta. Very cute. So the, whole thing the whole thing comes out, yes. And if it comes out, some mothers uh, store it. Remember, placenta is rich with stem cells. So this can be stored for possible use of adult stem cells for the baby. Umbilical cord. Me too, my mom, my mom, the hardened skin. Okay, well, so we're almost done here. Um, application, gestational time, mass growth and development strategies. This, in a nutshell, it just means the longer the gestational period, gestational period is when you're inside the womb, the longer the time you're inside the womb, the more developed you are when you come out. Example, uh, I think example there they have are for elephants. Elephants, how long do they? What's the gestational period? Can you please look? 22 months. Us, it's just nine months. So, almost two years. <laughs> but when they come out, baby elephants are fully developed. And they can even start, like, um, walking already. For us, we come out, we can't walk yet. It's just nine months. So the longer the gestational time, the more developed the offspring is. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. As else, don't forget to print. Ten minutes left. All right. Nature of science. Last, last, last. The nature of science here says assessing risk and benefits of Scientific research, the risk to human male fertility were not adequately assessed before steroids related to progesterone and estrogen released in the atmosphere as a result of the use of female contraceptive pills. So assessing the risk of estrogen pollution. Let me simplify. So for, um, for couples who want to get pregnant, remember in IVF, we inject them with hormones to stop their monthly cycle and then we inject hormones to know exactly when they're gonna ovulate so those pills that we keep giving them um, or those couples who don't want to get pregnant they can't keep taking pills what happens is this pills where will it go 
So I don't want to get pregnant. I take pills. It, it goes out of my body in the urine and in my, in my urine. Where will it go when you flush it? Where will, eventually, that water will, can go into our water system. So what? This is what they've observed. Okay, let's try to analyze this. Percent of fish, oocyte in testis, feminized reproductive ducts. Look at that. Um, percentage of fish, there's, there's, through the years, there keeps, there, there seems to be an increasing trend of female characteristics in male fish. We just observe it in fish. But this is the implication. If it can change the physiology of fish, then can it also change the physiology of humans? Who eats the fish? We do, right? So the hormones we release to the water, fish are affected, we eat the fish. So what happens to our composition? Like, for example, males, they keep consuming estrogen, progesterone. Is it possible? Um, to the extreme, they were saying that this can be a cause for um, incidents of homosexuality because males are more exposed to female hormones. We don't know. That's just an assumption. But it's very clear for fish. 1980s, first reports about elevated estrogen pollution. 1992, 61 studies, human sp sperm count declined by 50%. So the use of contraceptives has correlated, is now correlated to um, male problems, infertility. So some government census here, UK, they limited, what is this? 86% of male fish sampled showed feminization. In 2012, limit the concentration of the water. So making sure, like, yes, we can use those contraceptive pills, but how do we control its levels in the water? Can we do some treatment of the water to make sure, la, 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 la. I read that part of the NOS. Questions? Let me go back to my concept map. So we learned how to produce sperm, how to produce egg. We learned the three steps of fertilization, internal fertilization, acrosome reaction, penetration, cortical reaction. Then we learned about implantation of your blastocyst. It produces HCG. Then we learned after eight weeks, we call it a fetus that um, has this part called the placenta, make sure that nutrients and waste are exchanged with the mom. We learn parturition, negative feedback, decrease of progesterone, suddenly increase oxytocin, start of muscle contraction. Example of positive feedback, you keep increasing oxytocin until the baby comes out. That's it. I will assign, I will assign these two videos in Edpuzzle. Mm. Permatocyte. Spermatogonia is small, and then it will increase in size. You call it a primary spermatocyte. I offer them the same size. Um, can you also look at page 501? Thank you, Shelly, since you talked about that. Uh, 501 diagram. Okay. From outside to inside, remember I said outside is your oogonia. And then it further develops into your primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, your spermatis, and then your spermatozoa or sperms. You see this white cell right here? Okay. That's what you call the nurse cell. Where's the name? It's not here. Nurse cell. This nurse cell nurses. You see how it's attached to the sperm cell? It nurses the growing sperm. Nurse cell. Um, and then you have... Uh, nurse cells are also called Sertoli cells. Maybe that's easy to remember. Our nurse here is male. Sir, what's his name? <laughs> Or something. So the nurse cells are called sertoli cells. They nourish this growing 
um, spermatozoa. You also have interstitial cells. I'm sorry. I use the student's PowerPoint. Let me go back. Here. Um, so you have nurse cells here inside the seminiferous tubule. Now in between the seminiferous tubule, like right here, right here, right here, in between the tubules, you have interstitial cells. You're not writing. Okay, bala kayo guys. So there's interstitial cells. We call them Leydig cells. Interstitial cells and Leydig cells. It's in page 500. Sir Tola inside, maybe you can take Sir, then outside is Lady. Lady and Sir. Lady cells, Sir Tola cell. Your Lady cells, this is in the old curriculum, um, helps in the production of testosterone. Sir Tola cells nurses your growing spermatozoa. Interstitial cells or Leydig cells produce testosterone. Nurse cells or Sertoli cells nourish the growing spermatozoa. All right. 